Good morning. Let's talk about the scientific method and homeostasis. These are two, well, the, the scientific method is a process, process that we use to come to conclusions about nature. You know, things like that gravity exists, that it attracts, it, it, it's, it's an attractive force, things of that sort is all done by what we call the scientific method. It allows for us to systematically gather data about nature, about us, about the world, and, you know, give us a better grip on what is real and what is imagined. Okay. So the scientific method, scientific method can be approached in two ways. Okay, there is what's called the, the in, in inductive approach. Well, first, let's do the other one. There, there is the, the deductive approach. And this approach is what's often called theoretical science. This is where theorists sit down at the computers, have models of different factors and can draw some conclusions about how things are going to be or how they work. For example, you know, based on, let's say, fossil records, we can project backwards into time, in time to have an idea as to when life first began, okay? Or based on how far stars are away from each other, we can make projections into the past as to when the Big Bang occurred, how old the universe was. So these are theoretical approaches that we use where we use logic to deduce things backwards in, or even forward. Okay, so this is a logical reasoning approach that's used to gather information about the world, about, about nature, about the universe. Then we also have the inductive way. This one you are probably more familiar with. This is one that's done by experimentation, the typical ex experimental approach here, okay. where you can devise an experiment to test an idea, and based on the data that you get, you then draw a, a conclusion. That's, being, that, that's doing science inductively. Most times, you know, we need the, the deductive approach to really stretch our minds, get to the margins of what we know, to think of new things that may be true or may not, or what, you know, may prove not to be true, but at least we have the edges being uncovered by, by your th the theoretical approach. And then eventually, the, the inductive approach is used to confirm the deduction that we make, most times actually. So they, they both kind of work together, but, but they have different, away, different ways of approaching the question. So, in the scientific method, there are a few steps that's taken. Okay, so steps or basics or principles of the scientific method. Okay. So there is the first step of it, you know, the, more, the more classical step, what we call observation. So you observe a phenomenon in your environment, and then you postulate or put together a explanation of what is going on there. So that's called the, the hypothesis. Okay. This is a testable, testable explanation of the phenomenon, hypothesis. And then you do experimentation. Where you test your hypothesis, and then you use the data gathered from the experiment to draw a conclusion. So then you conclude conclusions based on the data that you gathered from your experiment. Now, when you design, say, an experiment, a few things need to be in place 
to ensure that it's a good experiment. So the characteristics of good experimentation include things like some properties of good design, good experimental design. One, th one, one, one of the, 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 the things that you want to do is to ensure you have a large enough sub subject size, so, so large groups. The bigger the group is, other than cost factors and just being able to manage too much data, large groups will reduce on random randomness in your data. So, so this is how you reduce the you know randomness of events that can impact your data. If you have two people in an experiment and they both show a change, it's possible that the change is just random, it's just happening. Okay, but if you have a thousand people showing the same trend or change, chances are there's something real there. It's not a random event anymore. So larger groups will reduce on a random, very random effects on your data. You also have to have different groups. Okay. At minimum, you must have a, a group that's treated and a group that's untreated. This way, you can then determine what's the effect of treatment on the results that you get. Okay, so for example, let's say you want to study the effects of smoking on lung cancer, right? So here, in one group, you have smokers. In the other group, you have non-smokers. And this is an appropriate test to see what the effect of smoke is on, say, a particular health outcome, like maybe lung cancer, okay? So make sure you must have at that minimum two groups there, one treated, one untreated. And then you also want to control for bias in your data. So data bias. You know, you don't want people to help you out. You want them to just, you want the subjects to report or provide data that's kind of independent of what they hope for, to hope to happen. So we do what's called we blind study. Blind study, usually here, the groups don't know what they are, how they've been treated or what treatment they're receiving. Okay, so subjects here are unaware of what group they're in. Are they in the treated group or the untreated group? And sometimes we may even go further and what's called double blind study, where neither the subjects or the investigator is aware of what groups is being treated with what kind of treatment. And at the end of the experiment, then you reveal a key to see what results were. And, 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 and that way you can more or less ensuring that neither the investigator or the subjects are, can bias your data in a way towards what they, they want, the, the outcome that they want. Okay. All right, so that is the basics of good experimental, experimental design and the basics again of how we approach things, approach questions in nature using the scientific method. Let's look at homeostasis. So homeostasis refers to a dynamic state or a, it refers to the processes that the body uses to maintain your internal environment at a constant uh, level. Okay, so homeostasis is 
the process of maintaining constancy in the internal environment, meaning things like your blood pressure, the level of glucose in your blood, your pH, your body temperature, those, those things that keep you alive must be maintained at a certain level, right? You can't allow for your temperature to spike or drop too low. Those kind of changes are not consistent or not conducive to, to, to life or health, okay? So you have to have some way to maintain your environment in some, some level of constancy. That's called homeostasis or homeostatic mechanisms. So to do this, the body employs what's called a feedback system. So it uses a feedback system. In fact, specifically it uses what's called a negative feedback system that's able to respond to undo whatever just happened. That's why it's called negative. This job is to, if, some, if something happens, say to your body temperature, its job is to do the opposite, undo it, so you can maintain things in, in the normal or more, at a more constant level. So in a feedback loop in general, you have certain players there. So you have the receptor, the receptor's job in this kind of feedback system is to detect the change. Detect change, whatever is happening. Okay. So you have things like bioreceptors det detect blood pressure. Thermoreceptors detect body temperature. Okay, so you, have, you must have specialized neurons or structures that can detect that something is changing. Okay. Then you have an integrator. The integrator's job is to decide on how to respond to the change. Okay, so, th so this is your decision maker. How to respond. And then your effector would represent the muscles or glands that make the change. So these produce the change. That'll make it work. For example, let's give you an example here. So let's say for body temperature regulation, okay? And let's say you have an increase. This is the this is the, 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 the stimulus, an increase in body temperature will be detected, okay. detected are what's called thermoreceptors. So thermoreceptors, in this case, are special neurons that respond to changes in temperature. So your thermoreceptors act as a receptor, and these thermoreceptors will relay the information in to the integrator. And in this case, the integrator is a part of the brain called your hypothalamus. And then the hypothalamus, in turn, will make, make the, the decision of how best to respond to an increase in body temperature. And so then it will then target your effectors. In this case, if you have an increased body temperature, the structures that will respond will be things like your sweat glands, okay, and your blood vessels. So these act as the effectors. And what they'll basically do is that they will cause you to sweat and cause what's called vasodilation, the blood vessels to dilate. And these two changes, sweating and blood vessel dilation, will lead to a drop 
in body temperature. And so an increase eventually leads to a decrease. That's why it's called a negative feedback system to make sure that you bring, bring the temperature back to where it should be. Again, so we can make sure you, you can ident identify the, the role players here. Receptor, in this case, is the thermoreceptors. Receptor there. This is your integrator. Okay. And here are your effectors. And they produce the effect, which is sweating and vasodilation, which then creates the outcome you want, which is a drop in, blood per in, in, in body temperature. Okay. Now, there's also another um, feedback that's, that's sometimes used, but it's not used in the context of homeostasis. It's used for other reasons, such as you know, um, blood clotting or childbirth. That's called a, a positive feedback system. So in a positive feedback mechanism or system, this one is not used for homeostasis. Not used for homeostasis. And in this one, the change that happened is amplified, it's made bigger by this system. For example, for say blood clotting, right? If you tear your blood vessel, platelets come, come in the area to start to block that, that torn blood vessel and they in turn attract more platelets to the area and over and over again until they're all bunched in the area to block it effectively for you. That, that's, that, that, that's a case of a positive feedback where you make it bigger and bigger and bigger until you plug the hole. Same for childbirth, right? When the baby's coming out, it stretches the uterus and you respond by squeezing more, which causes the head to stretch the cervix. So you squeeze more on the uterus, which then causes the cervix to stretch some more, and you do it again, 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 until the baby's out. Okay, there's a positive system. And these systems have a natural end to them, a natural end. At some point, your blood will stop bleeding. At some point, the baby will get out of the body. Otherwise, if these systems are allowed to run constantly, that will deplete you of your energy, right? And you basically lead to death. So at some point, they have a natural stop somewhere, somewhere in there. Okay, we'll stop there.